Story is a central preoccupation of my life and I work with other people helping to shape their stories and if there's one thing I know about a story it's that a character can't be passive and blame other people in a great story. They have to take control of their own destinies. But at the risk of alienating you, I, I'm going to tell you that everything that, I'm going to, uh, that happened after this was my mother's fault. So, I'm watching the news with my mother nine months ago and we're looking at the refugee crisis and she says to me, I don't know why you don't go and volunteer. It's not like you have any responsibilities holding you back. And I see in a speech bubble, you don't have a husband or children. <laughs> um, and it's true, because whether by design or not, I have managed to reach middle age with almost none of the adult responsibilities most people have. I work for myself, I decide my own schedule, I don't have a partner, I don't have children. And my main purpose in life is knocking a bit of crack out of it. So without much thought in the way that I approach a lot of things, I signed up to volunteer. I knew somebody had done it and she told me. So I said, great, when was my calendar free? I'll go in August. And I'm busy knocking a bit of crack out of life and August starts approaching and I'm thinking, what am I doing? Um, because I do a lot of fundraising and I'm kind of a pain in the ass for most of my friends that way. But the only thing that ever came close to boots on the ground volunteering was when I went and reported in Zimbabwe on the work that the VSO and their partners were doing there. And that was an intense experience, but I was still just observing the work and observing the conditions there. And this was actually getting literally your hands dirty. But thank God my best friend Jean said, are you terrified? And I went, yeah. And she said, I better come with you. So off we went and we met a woman I knew in Paris, an Irish woman there who told us about how to volunteer. And we arrived in the Calais jungle and I was absolutely horrified at where we had to stay, <laughs> which was like this grubby little caravan. And I was like, do you know what? I could probably just like donate the money and all the supplies that I brought and hightail it. But thank God I had my friends there with me, not for emotional support, but they would have told everybody I did that. So I had to stay for a week. And it ended up being this amazing experience. Every morning we cleaned the camp um, because there was real danger of disease. Uh, and so we'd have to do pretty filthy work cleaning up uh, whatever detritus had been left behind. And in the afternoons, we'd go and teach in the school, which was just a collection of rickety tables and chairs, no roof or rooms. And refugees would just turn up there who wanted to learn a bit of English, and we'd no resources. So we were sort of making it up as we went along, but we did the best we could. And by the end of that week, I had so fallen in love with it and how amazing the people were there that I was lacing up my boots on the last day and I said, if I could just keep raising money, I would just stay. I'd just stay here with the refugees. And Jean said, ooh, Mama Mary, who'd play you in the movie of your life? I mean, now that Jean Wilder's dead, <laughs> because that was the main thing on Facebook that week, that Jean Wilder died. Um, but I had to leave. And that was a lot harder than being there. And the thing that the person who was hardest to leave for me was a boy called, I'm going to call him Carlos for the purpose of this story, a 16 year old unaccompanied minor from South Sudan. And I noticed him and met him on the very first day. He was terribly shy. And the next day, when I greeted him by name, he sort of lit up. And after that, I always made a point of looking out for him. And I'd noticed his shoes were very shabby. So I'd asked him what his shoe size was. And then he'd shown me, he had almost no English, that he, his belt, he had no belt. His jeans were held up with strings. So I'd got him some kit and I'd snuck it to him. Um, and uh, we were doing English lessons. He's very diligent. But I said to him, take a break, because he looked tired and he kept writing in his copybook. I thought, he's such a good student, you know? And then he slid the copybook over to me and he'd written in it, I will never forget you. And that broke my heart. And I just took his hand and said, I won't forget you either. And after I got back, I kept having this vision of Carlos at the gate of the building where I live. And I thought, yeah, but he, like, if he makes it to the UK, which was his dream, he'll be like 24. He'll be a man by the time, if I ever see him again. 
But I thought I'll go back. The only way I could leave was to tell myself I'd go back. So I booked to go back at the end of October. And then I got a call from the charity saying, don't come, they really are bulldozing the camp this time, which they kept threatening to do. But the refugees didn't believe they would. But they followed through on it this time. So I cancelled my trip. And then I saw on the news that they had taken all the adults out of the camp, but they'd left the unaccompanied minors. And as far as I can tell, the French government was just playing chicken with the UK government going, well, they want to go to the UK, come and get them. So the camp's being bulldozed and there's 1,200 kids with no adults. So I rang the organisation that I'd been volunteering with and I said, look, I have to come back, I have to find Carlos. And this woman said, look, that's ridiculous. They're only letting on like 30 people a day, the most hardened and experienced volunteers, and let's agree, you're not that. And I said, well, I'd like to see them try to stop me. And she said, I have two words for you, tear gas, because we had been tear gas twice while we were there. And then she said, Mary Kate, if you get there, then what will you do? If you find him, what will you do? And I realized there was nothing I could do. And she said, honestly, if you turn up as emotional as this, you'll be needing help. You're not going to be help to anybody. And that was kind of the worst moment of my life, to know there was a child out there in the world that I cared about and there was nothing I could do to help him. And I'd never been confronted with anything like that in the privileged life that I've lived. But the other thing that had really struck me about Carlos was I'd asked him if he wanted a phone. A lot of the refugees had phones. And he'd looked at the ground and said something in his own language and his friend Mohammed, who would translate for him, said, he doesn't have anyone to call. And um, apart from the fact that that was heartbreaking, I was also like, he's not really got any hustle. I'm pretty sure if I asked my 16-year-old nephew if he wanted a phone, he'd say, yes, can I have an iPhone 6 and can I have 100 euro of credit on it, you know? And I just thought, I don't think this kid has what it takes to get to the front of any queue, just in his meekness. And it's a lovely quality in him, but he's not gonna make it in these circumstances. So through various other people who did have phones, I got messages to Carlos and he got messages back to me and eventually somebody gave him a phone and the unaccompanied minors were moved to a camp in the south of France in Biscarros and I was able to Facebook with him then and there was a resolution passed in the Dole here that Ireland was going to take 200 of the unaccompanied minors and I started trying to see if I could get them on that list and I just encountered this massive wall of bureaucracy. It was really distressing. I would send emails after emails, doorstop people. I couldn't even figure out which department was responsible. I was emailing the head of the camp in Biscarros. The only replies I would ever get would be, yes, we have received your email. We'll reply in due course. And I started to get monomaniacal about this. I decided at one stage I was going to smuggle him in my car. And then my sister was like, we should practice with me. And I was going, what if we get caught? And she said, well, we'll say we had an argument. You put me in the boot as a punishment. <laughs> And then I decided I couldn't put him in the boot of a car and I'd have to buy a camper van. And so this was all going ahead. And I told my sister, Rebecca, and I wondered if she would tell me I was insane. But Rebecca said to me, Mary, do you remember when you were like 10 and you read I Am David and you couldn't wait till I was old enough to read it, so you then read it to me? And we thought if we were ever in a Holocaust, we'd do the right thing. This is it. This is their Holocaust. Go and get him. And... Then two things happened. One was that I found my way to the senior social worker for unaccompanied minors in Ireland. And he said, look, the resolution has been passed, but I promise you what's going to happen is the government's going to sit on their hands now till those kids are all 18. It's not going to happen. And the other thing was that he said, look, if a family could take him, there might be some chance. And I thought, I've made all the wrong choices in my life. I should have a husband, I should have a home, I should have a family, and then I would be able to take Carlos. But a friend of mine got in touch with me, and she said, we'll take Carlos. We've been, like, applying to foster a teenager anyway. And I thought, I've made all the right choices in my life. <laughs> because I know somebody like that who would do that. And then the senior social worker for unaccompanied minors called me back and he said, I've been given the mission and I'm going to build it around Carlos. And um, he rang me and he said, he said, in January, I'm going to go and assess him. Do you want to bring him anything? And I said, I want to bring him a pair of boots because the first boots I bought him had been left behind in Calais. And when I went to his office to bring the boots, this social worker came out with his arms like this. I was like, oh, are we hugging? And he said to me, Mary Kate, I never get a happy ending.
This is the only happy ending I've ever had. Carlos is coming to Ireland. So, Carlos came to Ireland 31 days ago. <laughs> My friends are going to foster him and I'm going to be his respite foster carer. And all I know is when I was on this mission that a lot of people said to me, you know, we have to take care of our own first. And I said, they are our own. They are our own. And the men and women who fought and died for Ireland's freedom didn't fight and die so that we would hold it tight to ourselves and say, we're sorry, we can't share. We can share. So... When you meet an African Irish man, <laughs> you can ask him if one time he used the nickname Carlos. <laughs> he will get an Irish passport and be an Irish citizen, and so will the other unaccompanied minors, the 200 that we've taken. Ireland's the only country that's followed through on its commitment. And we could take 200 more, we could take 2,000 more, we could take as many as we wanted. The only thing is not to be in the prison of the fear that we don't have enough to share. We do. Thank you.